If you don't have anything nice to say, you are in the right video because we are getting petty today in a good way. I am doing something I have been dying to do for years and that is my sunscreen ranking tier list. I'm gonna be ranking sunscreens top tier, middle of the road and oh my gosh, leave that nonsense on the shelf. If you're new here, I'm a board certified dermatologist and sunscreen is the most important, most evidence-based skincare product you can put in your routine when you use daily on a consistent basis has the greatest impact on the overall health of your skin long term. And I have lots of videos on this channel explaining the benefits of sunscreen away. But maybe you've been using sunscreen and you're like, this is not quite living up to the hype. I don't like this. I don't want, I don't want to go there. Well, maybe this video will help you out in choosing one that is top tier and gets you where you need to be. I'm going to be considering in this video, as far as how I made the list, things like how well the product spreads on the skin, how it feels, how it performs. I'm going to be highlighting pluses and minuses of the categories and I'm going to also guide you to how you might want to choose one for yourself based on your particular skin concerns. So starting with the top tier, category number one is arguably at the top. For me personally, it's also a little bit of personal bias. This is what I reach for on the regular. It's easy to apply. It feels more lightweight, more comfortable, and that is an organic sunscreen. And by organic, I'm not talking broccoli from Whole Foods. I am talking organic as an organic chemistry. Organic chemistry, the study of carbon compounds, carbon compounds being the active ingredients in these sunscreens that work by absorbing ultraviolet radiation and dissipating that as heat. Now, the heat it dissipates is not enough to change the temperature of your skin or affect any kind of thermal related injury to your skin, just to clear that misconception up. But yeah, that's how they work. The reason I like these so much and why I put them in a top tier is that they don't leave a white cast. They tend to not be as greasy or heavy on the skin and they're perfect, perfect for for hot humid climates because they allow the manufacturer to take advantage of a gel vehicle as opposed to strictly the cream vehicles. And the gel vehicles are a lot more lightweight, breathable, fast dry, and allow for good evaporation of sweat. The last thing you want is to be working out in your yard, trying to mow the lawn in the heat, in the sun, you're sweating and you know you need to reapply sunscreen. It's like, oh gosh, I have to put this oppressive film on top of an oppressive film. You need a gel vehicle. If you're gonna look for a gel vehicle, it's going to be an organic, aka chemical sunscreen as they're commonly referred to. Now the downside of these is that they can burn and sting, especially around the eyes. So if you have really sensitive skin or rosacea, they may not be right for you, but they're great in that they don't leave that off-putting white cast on the surface of the skin. These personally are my favorite and what I reach for on the regular. Then category number two in the top tier is going to be inorganic sunscreen. Inorganic sunscreens, aka mineral, these are chemicals also, okay? These are also chemicals. They are not carbon compounds, but rather sheets of metal oxides. These sheets of metal oxides in inorganic, aka mineral sunscreens, work to protect your skin by absorbing ultraviolet radiation and dissipating that as heat. Again, the heat is not enough to raise the temperature of your skin. Wait, wait, isn't that how the organic ones you said work? Yeah, they work basically the same. Yes, it's true that inorganic, aka mineral sunscreens, do to a certain extent work by blocking UV rays, but that's really not the main way in which they work, contrary to what you might have heard. They primarily work by absorbing UV rays and dissipating that energy as heat, just like the organic, aka chemical ones. And as a reminder, these are all chemicals. Okay, that point aside, uh, mineral sunscreens, inorganic sunscreens, they're a great option if you are very sensitive. If you don't like the burning, stinging, they also tend to be well tolerated around the eyes, good for irritated eczema prone skin where that chemical sunscreen might burn and sting a bit more. The downside of inorganic mineral sunscreens is that they leave a white cast, especially if you have a deep deeper skin tone, they show up on the skin surface. Yeah, yeah, they do. Even if the brand is claiming this is a sheer, no cast uh, mineral sunscreen. No, no, no. Sunscreens need to be applied liberally. And when applied liberally and correctly, if it's an inorganic sunscreen on a deeper skin tone, there will be something showing up on the surface of your skin. If you see an advertisement for a mineral sunscreen on a deeper skin tone and it does not leave any kind of white cast, how much are they applying? I find these advertisements are highly misleading and in most cases, cases, the model is microdosing the sunscreen. This water doesn't get me wet. Okay, well, you applied a droplet, all right, and it evaporated quickly. What's your point? Dump a bucket on your head and you will be soaked. 
How do you know if it's organic or inorganic? This is starting to get too chemistry oriented. It's confusing. Simple thing to do is to look at the active ingredients. They will be called out separately, at least if you're buying a sunscreen here in the US because our sunscreens are regulated as drugs. They're required to call out the active ingredients. If the sunscreen says zinc oxide, titanium dioxide, and that's it, either zinc oxide or titanium dioxide, congratulations, that is an inorganic mineral sunscreen. You are pretty much done at that point. But if you don't see those ingredients, you see some other kind of complicated sounding names like avabenzone, octisalate, that is an organic sunscreen, carbon compounds in that case. But what if you see both? There's zinc oxide and then there's this octocrylin thing that doesn't sound like a mineral. Then you have category number three in the top tier and that's a hybrid sunscreen. Hybrid sunscreens are a hybrid of organic and inorganic. They've got the inorganic actives, usually zinc oxide, and they also have some carbon compounds in them as well as the active ingredients, usually like octisalate or octocrylin. These are really nice because they tend to not burn and sting as much as their all organic counterparts. The cast is still there because you have usually zinc oxide or sometimes titanium dioxide or sometimes even both. So there is still some cast, but in most cases, the hybrid sunscreens, the cast is not nearly as noticeable as the truly all inorganic AKA mineral sunscreens are. So it's, it's more doable for a lot of people. Less likely to burn the sting around the eyes. It, it kind of balances out a lot of the negatives of both. You kind of get something that's that's like a little bit more meet you in the middle, if you will, as far as cast, burning, stinging. Yeah, I, I personally really like hybrid sunscreens a lot. Now the final top tier category of sunscreen and one that can really be amazing and offer more than just UV protection is gonna be a tinted sunscreen. Most tinted sunscreens I find are inorganic, aka mineral, although you will find some tinted organic sunscreens. Now a lot of people will claim that the benefit of the tinted sunscreen is that it masks the white cast of a of, of the mineral sunscreen, right? No, it doesn't. It, it, it doesn't really, I mean, it, it turns it from white sometimes to terracotta. So it's not as though it no longer shows up on the surface of your skin. A lot of people with deeper skin tones told to use tinted mineral sunscreens only to apply it properly and find out it looks like they have terracotta on their face, okay? Because you still get that, that, that appearance oftentimes. But the real reason for the tint being advantageous is that the tint comes from iron oxides, which protect from blue light from the sun. So when it comes to hyperpigmentation, that's amazing because hyperpigmentation, whether it be melasma or post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation, is driven by both sun's ultraviolet rays as well as sun's visible blue light wavelengths of light. Both of those, and non-tinted sunscreens only protect against the UV rays, that's what they're meant to do, but the iron oxides can protect against those other pigment drivers, the HEV wavelength, uh, blue light. So that is one to really lean into if you have melasma or hyperpigmentation. I, I wish there were more organic sunscreens that were tinted. We're getting more here and there. Um, those are great because they don't leave that white cast. Um, but that's one to choose if you have skin that heals with hyperpigmentation readily, which tends to be the deeper skin tones. All right, so that's the top tier list. What about mid tier? Mid tier is gonna be what I like to call the sunscreen condiments. Like they don't make the meal, all right? You're not gonna just eat a bowl of mustard. Mustard's great on things. Um, relish is great on things, but we're not gonna pull up a tray of mustard and, and relish. That is, that, that that's bizarre. What do I mean by sunscreen condiments? We're talking sprays, we're talking powders, we're talking sticks. These types of sunscreens, they suffer the limitations of not putting a good amount of sunscreen on the skin to reliably pr protect you. So in other words, you should not rely on those alone as your means of sunscreens. For example, the sunscreen sprays. So many people rely on sunscreen sprays for a day outdoors at the beach only to come back burned like, oh, the sunscreen didn't work. I'll tell you why it didn't work because those sprays don't often put enough on the skin and it ends up on the floor, especially if there's a gust of wind by. Now they can put a good amount on the skin, but you have to use them correctly. And once people learn how to use them correctly, they're like, oh, that takes the appeal away from the spray. To use them correctly, you've got to do multiple passes of the spray back and forth in close proximity to the skin and then physically rub that in. You're like, oh, I, I like the spray because I didn't want to rub stuff in. You got to rub the spray in, okay? You got to rub the spray in. Don't spray sprays on your face. Don't spray them directly on your face. First of all, you're not getting very much on there. Check out Lab Muffin Beauty Science. She did a experiment showcasing this very thing. You don't get very much on the skin when you do that. Um, maybe a few droplets here and there, but not, not much. And you're not getting an even layer. So to use them on the face, you got to spray them in your hand and 
then rub them into your face. And again, once people learn that, they're like, no, okay, no. I, I thought this whole time that I was avoiding having to touch my face by using a spray. No, you're not. Now the sticks can help you in avoiding having to touch your face because you do multiple passes, although ideally you rub those in too. But those can be really helpful for applying around the eyes, I find, um, and they tend to not run into the eyes as readily because they don't have the water content in them that makes them runny. I also like using them when I'm out and about on the go and I don't want to be touching my face because maybe I don't have the ability to wash my hands. If it's cold and flu season, you know, hand to mouth contact is one way in which people end up getting a cold or a flu. And so the stick is kind of a nice way, although I mean your hand is still up by your face, but you know what I mean? So sticks can be useful, but I would never rely on them solely for sunscreen. I like using them actually on my lips, sort of like an SPF lip balm. The powders are probably some of the worst offenders because they really don't put anything. I mean, it's like little tiny micro dots of sunscreen with a whole bunch of whole bunch of space in between. The SPF powders I find are nice for mattifying shiny sunscreen, you know, dusting it on there to reduce the shine. Other than that, I would not rely on them as your sole means of sunscreen. Which brings me to another category of mid-tier and that's SPF makeup. A lot of times SPF and makeup, nice if you have it there, but don't rely on your makeup for your sunscreen. It's not always broad spectrum and you're very unlikely to apply enough of it to all surfaces to adequately protect. The other one that's on the bottom end of the mid-tier is going to be the sunscreen foams. So foams and mousses. They recently got a slap on the wrist actually from the FDA because again, very difficult to gauge how much you're putting on the skin and they are more vulnerable to under application. Check out my video all about that where I talk about the FDA warning against sunscreen mousses, foams, but the mid-tier ones, they're good to have around, all right? You know, they have a purpose. They're not useless. As long as they're broad spectrum, have them in the sunscreen wardrobe, but never rely on them solely as your, your main sunscreen. All right, and then the bottom feeder, walk away, don't use, are these ugh, products, which I don't even know why they still exist, but they do. And they're the SPF tanning products. So oftentimes it'll be a spray, of course, again, inadequate, but most of the time it'll be a very low SPF, SPF 15 or lower eight. I've seen products. And many times these products are not broad spectrum. They actually um, just protect from UVB. And what they do is basically delay burning so that you will then be more comfortable and able to stay out longer without burning so that you can tan. And if you're new here, tanning, it's not a good thing, okay? It's, it is the sun damaging your skin. Laying out and tanning to bronze your skin, that's UV exposure that is visibly damaging your skin. Just because it's socially acceptable does not mean it's healthy, okay? So what these products end up doing is that they basically put a very wimpy low level of SPF on the skin and encourage excessive UV exposure. And that is why they are, they are off the table. Don't mess with those, they are bad. They encourage excessive UV exposure and tanning, which we, mm. if you're still laying out tanning, you know, and you're coming here asking for a vitamin C serum, I'm gonna tell you to sit down, get a pen, a notebook, and start studying because you are behind the lesson plan. No amount of vitamin C serum is gonna do you any favors if that's what you're doing. All right, so what should you choose for your given skin concern? All right, if you have dry skin, look for a sunscreen that is a cream. Whereas if you have oily skin, you might wanna choose a sunscreen that is a gel vehicle. Tends to be a little bit more comfortable on oily skin. These gel sunscreens usually contain alcohol and alcohol is great for oily skin. It's great for humidity. If you have a deeper skin tone, really consider an organic sunscreen so you don't have to deal with the white cast thing unless it doesn't bother you. If you have very sensitive skin, you might wanna lean into the inorganic mineral sunscreens. They're great. In my mind, it doesn't matter if it's organic, if it's inorganic, if it's hybrid. Those are all top tier categories. So long as you use them consistently and you apply them liberally, uh, you need about a quarter to a half a teaspoon for the face and you know the neck. Uh, if you have a bald head, you know you're getting more into the half teaspoon because you gotta put sunscreen up there as well. For hyperpigmentation and melasma, I would, I would lean towards the tinted sunscreens, chemical or mineral. Like I said, mineral tends to be more common in the tinted category, but uh, chemical and okay, organic you can find as well and less likely to leave that chalkiness on the skin surface. What about for kids? What about for children? Children can use either chemical, mineral, or hybrid sunscreen. If they like it enough to put it on, that's the one to encourage them to use. They're safe for children. It's not recommended, however, to put any sunscreen on a child younger than the age of six months. I have a whole video all about sunscreens in baby 
babies and kids where I break that down even further. So those of you who are parents out there, please watch that video um, because I give a lot of very specific recommendations there. The key is to find a sunscreen that you like enough to wear to use. Make sure it's broad spectrum. Make sure you apply it liberally. If you're going to be participating in water-based activities, make sure it's water resistant or you're going to be sweating a lot. Choose a water resistant formula. Apply sunscreen about 15 minutes before going outdoors. And honestly, I tell people I'll do that. And then once you get to your destination of outdoor activities, apply again soon thereafter. That allows you to put more on the skin, increases the likelihood that you have a good layer and that you don't have any skip areas. Then you want to reapply every two hours while you're out there. If you're going to be doing water-based activities, well, then you're going to reapply when you get out of the water, you're going to pat dry the skin and reapply. If you're going to be on the water longer than 40 to 80 minutes, depending on the water resistance factor, you want to get out earlier, pat dry the skin and reapply because, you know, that's getting into the window of time where it's rubbed off too much. To recap, chemical, mineral, and hybrid, those are top tier. Mid tier, the sunscreen condiments would be powders, sprays, sticks, SPF makeup, and kind of at the bottom of that would be the mousses and foams. And complete bottom feeders do not use, they're just, they're just the sunscreen devils, if you will, because they're completely misleading, are those SPF tanning products, often have a very weak SPF, many times not broad spectrum, and encourage unsafe sun exposure, aka tanning, which is sun damaged. <laughs> yeah, it is. It will increase your risk of skin problems later on in life to do that. All right, y'all, let me know in the comments, what is your favorite category? What is your least favorite category? And if you're wondering, whoa, wait, wait, what's a good sunscreen? What's a good sunscreen? In the description box, I will post some links to sunscreens in each of these top tier categories so you get a sense there. Um, those are just sunscreens I happen to use, like, and recommend. But when it comes to sunscreen, it is a bit of a journey to find the one that you actually like enough to use. But hopefully this video helped you in navigating that sunscreen aisles. If you guys like this video, give it a thumbs up, share it with your friends. And as always, don't forget, sunscreen and subscribe. I'll talk to you guys tomorrow. Bye.